Welcome to the Connors Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. With me right now is the Fletcher Pratt Award winner for this year for the Civil War Roundtable, James McPherson, who also won a Pulitzer Prize for Battle Cry of Freedom. And he's going to be talking about, well, what are you going to be talking about, Professor? Well, actually, I'm going to be, uh, the, talk, the title of my talk is going to be The President and the General Who Would Not Fight. Now, most people um, might think that I'm talking about Abraham Lincoln and George McClellan, and indeed I've written uh, about McClellan and Lincoln, uh, but this is going to be about Jefferson Davis and Joseph Johnston. Johnston was really Davis's McClellan uh, in, in steroids, in a sense, because uh, Davis had problems with Johnston throughout the entire war. Lincoln's problems with McClellan as a general were for only about a year and a half of the war, although, of course, he ran against McClellan for president in 1864. But uh, this will be a, a, a talk about the tension between Davis and Johnston uh, over the question of Johnston's failure to keep Davis informed uh, when he was commander of what eventually became the Army of Northern Virginia, um, and and uh, the, the failure to carry out some of Davis's orders uh, as commander of that army. Then Johnston was wounded, but when he came back from uh, recovered from his wound, he eventually became commander of a couple of other Confederate armies, and, and Davis had the same problems with him in the Vicksburg campaign and, and most notably in the Atlanta campaign. So this will be a, a talk about. Um, uh, two different personalities and two different uh, uh, concepts of the strategy the Confederacy needed to carry on the war. Now let's go back on the background of Jefferson Davis. Unlike Abraham Lincoln, Jefferson Davis did have a military background. Can you explain that? Well, yes, he was a graduate of West Point, uh, class of 1828. Uh, he was a junior officer in the regular army for seven years after he graduated. Uh, he fought in the Black Hawk War in the early 1830s, the same the same war where Lincoln was a militiaman who didn't see who didn't see any action. Davis did see some action. Uh, then he um, uh, was a planter in Mississippi, large slave owner, uh, a commander of a Mississippi Volunteer Regiment in the Mexican War, where Davis was wounded and was kind of a war hero for helping to win the Battle of uh, Buena Vista in 1846, early 1847, actually. Uh, then he was uh, Secretary of War uh, in the Franklin Pierce administration in the 1850s, Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, after he was Secretary of War in the later 1850s. So he had an extensive uh, professional uh, training and experience as a, as a military man. Now, Johnston... Joe Johnston, he was a West Point graduate, so what was his background before the war? Well, uh, as you say, he was a West Point graduate. He remained, he was in the same class with Jefferson Davis, actually. They knew each other there, although they were not close. And the rumor that they uh, once fought over the same girl is, is a, a, a false rumor. That is sometimes uh, cited to explain the tension between them, but uh, that doesn't really, that's not really uh, true. Uh, but uh, Johnston remained in the uh, regular army, uh, uh, just like Robert E. Lee did after he graduated, uh, rose through the ranks, and on the eve of the Civil War, uh, Johnston was quartermaster general of the United States Army. But like most other Southerners in the United States Army, Johnston, like Robert E. Lee, resigned and uh, went with the Confederacy. And he was the a senior commander in Virginia until he was wounded uh, in the Battle of Seven Pines on May 31st, 1862, uh, and was replaced by Robert E. Lee as commander of what Lee then called the Army of Northern Virginia. All right, this tension between Johnson and Davis, Davis is commander-in-chief. Why does Johnson keep getting appointed to different positions during the war? Well, it was almost over Jefferson Davis's dead body, actually, um, Johnson had a lot of uh, support in the Confederate Congress among uh, other senior elements in the Confederate Army, uh, and the, the Confederacy was running short of, of generals as one after another was wounded or killed. Uh, so the pressure on Jefferson Davis to 
appoint Johnston to a senior position uh, was pretty intense. Uh, and Davis really did this, especially the, the third time when he appointed him as commander of the Army of Tennessee after its disastrous loss at Missionary Ridge in November 1863. And Johnston then was commander of that army in the campaign against Sherman in Georgia in 64. Uh, it was really against Davis's better judgment that Lee advised him to appoint Johnston. Uh, other uh, senior officers advised him to do so. Political leaders did. In my judgment, um, uh, Davis was right that Johnston had a fatal flaw, which was his uh, inability to make use of the resources he had, very much like McClellan. Um, and uh, his his uh, his uh, uh, tendency to find excuses for inaction, just like McClellan, uh, and his uh, his tendency to yield the initiative uh, to the enemy, and also uh, of course John, there was no love lost personally between Davis and Johnston as time went on, and Johnston became allied with political opposition to Davis in, in the Confederate Congress as well. So these tensions, I think, um, they didn't necessarily cripple the Confederate war effort uh, fatally, but they certainly handicapped uh, the Confederate war effort, and, and uh, it may have had a lot to do with the eventual defeat of the Confederacy. In your opinion, who would have been the better choice to Johnson, let's say the Army of the Tennessee, after Missionary Ridge in Chattanooga? Um, well, he could have appointed Beauregard, and uh, he gave that some consideration, but Beauregard was um, a prima donna, a narcissistic uh, character who thought uh, he was much better than he really was, and, and he too had clashed with with Davis, and so uh, he would have, he might have been a better choice than Johnston, but Davis didn't like him any better than he liked Johnston. Uh, other than that, uh, he had actually offered the command earlier to uh, General William Hardy, but Hardy uh, had turned it down, and <clears throat> actually he offered it to Hardy in November of '63 before. Uh, before um, uh, he offered it to Johnston, and Hardy had turned it down, thinking that he was not senior enough, uh, not um, experienced enough. And the Army of Tennessee had become a kind of uh, snake pit anyhow, quarrels among its senior officers, and I think Hardy didn't want to have anything to do with that kind of a, uh, with that kind of a difficult situation. Uh, Johnston was pretty good at... Um, at um, organizing an army like McClellan, uh, at um, uh, inspiring confidence among the soldiers, uh, just like McClellan. Uh, the one thing he couldn't do, just like McClellan, was was use that army in the way that his commander-in-chief, or their commanders-in-chief, both Lincoln and, John, and Davis, uh, wanted them to use the army. Now, their embattled relationship, did that have much to do with the negotiations at the end of the war? Well, the, the the title of my book, Embattled Rebel, is a kind of double meaning for embattled. Davis was embattled within in uh, his conflicts with uh, um, Johnston and, and Beauregard and uh, certain, um, pre I would also say, prima donna leaders in Congress, uh, but also embattled in the conflict with the, with the Union Army and with the Union government. The... the, the um, Davis's problems with his in, internal problems uh, did have something to do with the collapse of the Confederacy in the last six months of the war. Uh, Davis was a bitter ender. Uh, he was adamantly opposed to any kind of peace negotiations. Uh, he believed, uh, like uh, General MacArthur in 1951, that there was no substitute for victory. Uh, and he continued to hold out uh, for a, a possible victory uh, long after uh, the, the Confederacy had any real chance of victory. And that uh, generated, I think, a lot of internal conflict in the Confederacy in the last three or four months of the war. Uh, the buck stopped on Davis's desk, and as uh, things began to go 
disastrously wrong for the Confederacy, uh, especially after Lincoln's re-election as the U.S. president. Uh, Davis, of course, took the blame uh, for defeat, for failure, uh, for disaster, and that certainly uh, didn't you know, that didn't help his reputation at all. We're talking about a war that ended more than 150 years ago. Why do you think it's relevant today that people are studying the American Civil War? Well, primarily because the war resolved two uh, huge issues in uh, American society, American history. One was whether the United States would survive as one nation, indivisible, as we say in the Pledge to the Flag. Um, that was really uh, an open question uh, through the first 75 years of the country's history. And if the Confederacy had won the war, the United States would not have survived as one nation. But the victory of, of the Union forces uh, ensured that it would survive. Uh, and secondly, uh, it abolished the institution of slavery, which had plagued the United States from the very beginning of its existence and had made a mockery of the profession of the U.S. to be the land of the free and the home of the brave, etc. Uh, so it was the, the Civil War resolved those two, two issues and really shaped the future course of American development um, up until 1865 or 18, the 1860s at any rate, there had been two visions of what kind of country this ought to be competing with each other. One was what we would call the northern version, a free labor, capitalistic, democratic uh, society, uh, basically a kind of um, um, progressive uh, uh, society. Uh, urbanizing society, industrializing society, uh, and then the vision associated with the slave South, an unfree labor force, a plantation agriculture, um, kind of a um, aristocratic culture uh, in the South. Uh, today we look back on the triumph of the kind of uh, middle class, democratic, capitalist, uh, free labor North as inevitable, but that was by no means certain uh, until the 1860s, and the triumph of that vision of American society in the Civil War uh, has shaped the country ever since. Uh, and then on a more concrete level, of course, out of the Civil War came not only the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, but also the 14th and 15th Amendments. Uh, ensuring uh, the equality before the law of all citizens, even defining uh, the nature of American citizenship, um, enfranchising the freed slaves in the 15th Amendment. Uh, the 14th Amendment in particular has been the source of uh, all civil rights legislation that have been passed in our own time. Uh, and in fact, the 14th Amendment has been the source of more uh, jurisprudence and, and cases coming before the Supreme Court uh, over the 145 years or so since the uh, 14th Amendment went into came into existence, uh, then then all of the rest of the Constitution combined. Uh, so the the war really uh, is continues to live with us today because of the 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 huge. Uh, uh, consequences that uh, grew out of the war 150 years ago. What happened to Jefferson Davis after the Civil War had ended? Well, he was imprisoned for two years while the United States government tried to decide whether to try him for treason. In the end, they decided not to. Uh, he was released on bail, and then eventually the um, Justice Department completely dropped uh, any idea of trying him for, for uh, treason. And so he uh, lived uh, as a sort of uh, emblem of the lost cause in the Confederacy for 24 years after the Civil War. He had a number of uh, sort of um, figurehead jobs as uh, head of an insurance company, but they just wanted his name on the letterhead. Uh, and uh, a wealthy woman provided him with a, a, a residence in in um, Southern Mississippi, 
uh, he, he um, wrote his memoirs, which he called The Rise and Fall of the Confederate States, uh, which was a, um, a, 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 a kind of a uh, exoneration of, of himself and of the Confederacy. He, he, never, um, he never asked for a pardon. In fact, it was uh, under Jimmy Carter's administration in the 1970s that Congress finally uh, granted Davis his citizenship again, nearly 100 years after he had died. But the Davis became a kind of symbol of the lost cause of the Confederacy. He con continue, continued to insist that the Confederacy had been right. Uh, even though they lost the war, they, the, the cause for which they fought was the right one. Uh, he never recanted. Uh, unlike unlike many Southerners who did, Davis never did. Well, did he ever recant his position on slavery? No, he did not. He did not. Um, he 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 continued to say in um, that book published in 1881, "The Rise and Fall of the Confederate States of America," that um, the rise and fall of the Confederacy, I guess, that slavery had been a benign institution, uh, good for both blacks and whites in the South. Um, and that uh, it had been overthrown by force, uh, and and it had been overthrown illegally, unconstitutionally, uh, just like his championship of the Confederacy continued to defend slavery. So, May 11th, the Fletcher Pratt Award winner for 2016, James McPherson, talking about embattled rebel Jefferson Davis, commander-in-chief. And you're going to be answering questions from the floor, and I, I'm sure after a while somebody has a private question, they can come up and approach you about it. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make reservations, give us a call at 718-341-9811, May 11th at the 3 West Club, 3 West 51st Street. Admission for non-members is $60, but you get a three-course meal and get to hear Professor McPherson. Now, if somebody's interested in your books, do you have a single website or they just get on Amazon? Oh, they can go on Amazon. I don't have a website myself, no. Remember out there, those kids who... Starting to learn about the Civil War, Battle Cry of Freedom, number one book, I think most historians agree, number one book on the history of the Civil War. Well, I appreciate that. Okay, well, we'll see you on, we'll see you on May 11th.